Welcome to this week's episode of Bite Size Biohacks, where I'm going to be talking all about blood sugar and why it's important to manage those blood sugar spikes. So first of all, I'm going to give you some hacks, three main ways that you can start using at home to start managing your blood sugar much better. Um, Really easy ways and how that we can actually flatten that glucose curve. But before we get started, it's probably worth just summarizing for you what a normal range for blood glucose is. So your fasting glucose should be anywhere between four millimoles per liter and 5.4 millimoles per liter. Now, if you're overseas, if you're in the US, that would be 72 milligrams per deciliter to uh, 97 milligrams per deciliter. If you go above that and you're between 5.5 to 6.9 millimoles per litre, that would put you in the pre-diabetes range. And in the US conversion, that would be 99 to 124 milligrams per deciliter. Going above that, if you go to 7 millimoles per litre and above, or 126 milligrams per deciliter and above, that would put you in the diabetes range. Now, those are according to the guidelines both in the US and here with the NHS. However, what we refer to as being within sort of safe guidelines doesn't necessarily mean that they are optimal. So the NHS would say for safer eating, your spike level after eating shouldn't increase above 7.9 millimoles per liter. Now that may be normal, but isn't necessarily optimal. Ideally, what we want to avoid if you're tracking this with a continuous blood glucose monitor is a spike of no more than 1.7 millimoles per liter or 30 milligrams per deciliter. Now that can be quite hard to do. If I don't know if you've worn a continuous blood glucose monitor, but certainly as someone like myself, for example, who has PCOS, And so there's a degree of insulin resistance. I've had to work quite hard really to control my blood glucose. And I think that's why these continuous blood glucose monitors are so helpful because you can put them on occasionally and get some really, really good data. But there are things that you can do even if you're not tracking it. If you start looking in your journal and you're writing these things down or you're just noticing and observing how you feel and you start to feel a lot Uh, a lot more tired, you feel like you've got a crash or you're getting cravings during the day, Uh, these would be indicators that you're probably not handling your blood glucose that well. If you find that you're storing fat around your abdominal area, again, that would be an indicator. But you can also get something like an HbA1c done with your doctor, which will look at your kind of how sugary you've been effectively over the last 10 weeks or so, and how much glucose is effectively glycated on your hemoglobin. And that's really what that's measuring. So that can be a useful measure. Again, that's a free test you can ask your doctor for here in the UK. But to help you manage things like cravings, to help you manage your blood glucose better, and effectively to manage your energy, because I'm gonna explain how it affects the mitochondria as well in this episode, I want to give you some key hacks that you can do that. Now, the reason that we want to effectively flatten the glucose curve, and there is a fantastic book on this, by the way, that I've been reading called The Glucose Revolution uh, by Jeff in shelves in shelves but I hope I'm pronouncing her name right that is a brilliant book and it has loads and loads of different hacks in there that you can use but you need to understand that when you continuously spike your blood glucose you are actually affecting your mitochondria over time now the mitochondria are the little energy powerhouses of our cells so we really want to keep them as healthy as possible but when we constantly spike our blood glucose our mitochondria can be overwhelmed quite quickly uh, with the amount of glucose that's coming in And the thing is, when they get overwhelmed, what can happen is free radicals get produced more often. And more free radicals means more oxidative stress. Now, this is important because it can damage DNA, it can create mutations and ultimately lead to things like cancer. Oxidative stress is also a big driver of things like heart disease, type 2 diabetes, cognitive decline and aging. So we want to make sure that we're not having too many glucose spikes, and that will also help to protect our arteries as well. But one thing we can't see, and that Jessie, the glucose goddess, makes clear in her book, is that we can't see fructose spikes. We don't have any way of measuring for those currently. But whenever you're eating table sugar, which is sucrose, that is 50% glucose and 50% fructose. So if you are spiking your blood glucose, you are also spiking fructose. And this is an issue because fructose actually leads to things or too much fructose leads to things like fatty liver it also unfortunately leads to a process known as glycation 10 times faster than glucose spikes now glycation is where sugar molecules attach onto other molecules and damage them so an example would be wrinkles are something you can get from too much glycation because the um, molecules are attaching onto the collagen and breaking it down so we want to avoid glycation to the degree possible now 
We can't avoid it entirely. It happens from childhood onwards, um, but we want to minimize the effect of that damage. It can also represent in the eyes with things like um, cataracts, for example. And effectively what's happening is you're browning uh, on the inside, effectively like toast. But fructose also really overwhelms the liver, as I said. So you can get things like fatty liver. Um, it can create more fat gain in the body. It precipitates insulin resistance. And also the thing about fructose is you don't feel as full or satisfied when you've been eating it. And an easy way to get more fructose is through hyperpalatable foods, which often combine sucrose. So we've got glucose and fructose with inflammatory seed oils. So biscuits, cakes, donuts would be great examples of this. And that's why they're so bad for your uh, health, but they're also very hard to resist. So we wanna try and keep those out of our diet as much as possible and just keep them for very occasional, if anything. But there are some ways we know now that you do want to keep this spike within a very narrow range because the narrower the range, the better your health is going to be, the less cravings you're going to have, the less fat storage you should have. And actually they found that when you manage glucose spikes and they look at individuals who don't change the amount of calories they're eating, but they change the way those calories are composed in terms of the protein, fats and carbs and fiber, they can actually lose weight on the same number of calories by doing these things. So it isn't necessarily about dieting. So there are three key things that I just want to mention on this episode of Bite Size Biohacks to take, that you can take away and start using. The first one is fiber. Fiber is your friend. It has three key superpowers. First of all, fiber helps to reduce alpha amylase, Emily, sorry, which is the enzyme that breaks down starch into glucose. So by eating more fiber, you're actually gonna slow down the release of glucose into the blood. It also helps to slow down the release in another way because it slows gastric emptying. But the really cool thing is it also creates a viscous mesh inside your small intestine, which not just slows down the absorption, but also limits the absorption of glucose as well. So that's one way you can do is to introduce more fiber. And a great thing that is featured in the Glucose Revolution book, actually, is that you can start your food. The order in which you eat your meal makes a difference. So if you start with the fiber first, that will have a big impact on your glucose management for the rest of the meal. So eating the veggies first, even if you don't eat all the veggies first, it can be helpful. And uh, on the continent, what we see is people starting with a green salad, for example, that is a great way to start your meal if you can. But even any vegetables work in this regard. It will actually change the way because it will create this viscous mesh and prevent the fiber actually helps to prevent that release of glucose into the blood. So the order matters. So eating the vegetables first and then following with the protein and fat and then the starchy carbs at the end of the meal can make a big difference. So if you're out for dinner, actually having dessert is arguably better than going straight for the bread basket when you start. The only downside really with the dessert is you're probably gonna have fructose from the sucrose that's in it as well, but you will be slowing down the release of glucose. Now that actually brings me on to another point because if you're going to start with a salad or something like that, the other thing you can do that's really, really helpful in terms of flattening that glucose curve is actually to have vinegar. Now you can start this, start your meal with a tablespoon of vinegar in a glass of water. That would be one way of doing it. It's probably not necessarily the most palatable way unless you enjoy vinegar. Apple cider vinegar actually tastes the best, but any vinegar will work. Or you can make a dressing with olive oil and apple cider vinegar or any other vinegar to dress your salad or your vegetables first and start eating those. And that will also help to reduce blood glucose. Uh, lemon juice doesn't work as well in this regard. And the reason for that is because it contains citric acid, not acetic acid. And it's actually the acetic acid in the apple cider vinegar and or any other vinegar, in fact, that's really helping. And that's actually in one study been shown to decrease insulin by 20% and keeping insulin low is really important as well because that contributes to things like fat storage and insulin resistance as well. So how is that working the acetic acid? Well similar to fiber it's actually temporarily inactivating this alpha amylase into the bloodstream and it also very coolly encourages muscles to make more glycogen faster than usual which helps to um, the muscles to basically take up that glucose more efficiently. And the other thing that acetic acid does is it also reprograms your DNA slightly to help your mitochondria burn more fat. So that would be the second hack that I've picked up from this book is to have some vinegar and you can either have that on its own in a glass of water before eating or to actually combine that by having a green salad or something like that before the meal. And the ideal ratio that Jessie talks about that she's found is a ratio of one portion of salad or greens um, or any vegetables, in fact, first 
in proportion to the amount of carbs. So a one-to-one -one ratio of the starchy carbs you're going to have later. So uh, you can measure that out and, and kind of get that. But that's what she's found to work the best. And then the other thing, the third hack that I would say is breakfast. The way you start your day or you break your fast, if you're someone that's intermittent fasting for longer, is really, really important. When you've been fasting, you're going to be much more sensitive to glucose. So that first meal of the day, you want to make sure is not starchy carbohydrates, but contains fiber, contains protein, and contains fat. When you make a smoothie and you're blending up fruits or vegetables, you are kind of mushing up the fiber, so it doesn't work as well in terms of creating that mesh. So make sure you're putting in some nice healthy fats, like some seeds, some flaxseed oil or coconut nut oil, some protein, could be a vegan protein powder or something like that. Or you could be having, you might be having something separate like some vegetables and some eggs. But if you're blending up, just make sure that you are adding that protein and fats because that's really important because of the way that you are breaking up that fiber. So it's not going to work as effectively. And then you can enjoy your smoothie the same. But protein at the first meal is a trigger that I have found so many people drop body fat so effectively uh, at that very first meal of the day. So the key thing is don't spike your blood glucose first thing in the morning you're going to be on a roller coaster for the rest of the day and actually what the science shows is that you will have more disrupted glucose variability if you start the day on that roller coaster um, unfortunately it does have an impact on the way you metabolize your lunch and your dinner so those are the top three things we went through way more in my month in the female biohacker collective membership this month we did a whole month on metabolic flexibility we had a really fun challenge experimenting with different breakfasts if you had a tracker you were able to track it with a cgm or a device like a lumen but lots of people were just doing it with their journals and it was so much fun we got so many in insights in there that everyone shared and we're actually going to be revisiting it again in another couple of months after we look at stress and breathwork and resilience this coming July because I think that's going to also improve everyone's management of glucose and their metabolism so if you haven't checked it out yet and you'd like to come and join us over in there it's an amazing amazing community of women for you to come in and really learn how to optimally manage your health and you can check out all of the details over at angelafoster.me forward slash biohacker that's angelafoster.me forward slash biohacker and i'll see you next week for another bite-sized biohacks episode <laughs>